This is an interview with Dr. Dwayne Dumbleson, provost of the downtown campus, in his office, April the 25th, 1989. And this on, and you are on the center stage. Well, now, Bob, one of the things that I... And I'm going to take notes. Uh, oh, sorry. When I, uh, I, I look back with fondness on that uh, spring day in 1973 when I, uh, I was carried around the college by Bob Richburg. Remember, Bob was uh, sure was a department chair, division chair, on South Campus, and uh, for whatever reason, he hooked up me with a fellow named Bob Gentry, uh, who was, uh, I guess you were the division chair of a whole bunch of things at Kent Campus at the time. Yeah, every, and, everything. At and I came here replacing uh, Joe Sasser, who was on leave. Um, I think he's on educational leave, studying on his doctorate. But uh, I was grateful that you uh, you and I hit it off pretty well right away. And, uh, you know, my experience, having come from the University of Georgia and being in the university environment to here, the thing that's impressed me enormously is the, is the capacity of community college education to meet the needs of a wide spectrum of the population. If you think about it, um, you know, you, you think about what's going on in the world and so on. Up until the community college movement got going, there were there was a whole niche in education that was unfilled by any organized uh, group. I suppose a few universities here and you know a few there had some things going for them, but. Um, Somebody asked me just the other day if I was, uh, you know, with my background. So why didn't I go teach at some university? And I said, I don't want to teach at a university. I want to stay here at the community college because it's here in this setting that we're meeting the needs of, of so many different kinds of people. Um, Which a university does, uh, in a sense, or not as much as... Well, you know, the universities don't... What the universities don't do is they don't have vocational educational programs. They don't have adult basic education programs. We've even got high school completion that most universities don't. In addition to all of our traditional community college transfer programs and all those kinds of things. Um, and then we open that market to which we know on this college called Open Campus, but which is really generally called continuing education. And it is a, you know, I was looking at the, at the new catalog of all the offerings we have, and it's a smorgasbord of, of delight in terms of every kind of skill you could want to gain, every kind of fun thing you'd want to do, every kind of area you'd want to grow in your life, we offer it. And there aren't very, you know, there aren't very many other kind of educational settings. Although universities and high schools both have come to offer some of those things since the community colleges started offering them because they're in competition now. You know, we know that's where the dollars are. I remember that uh, you assigned me, which I thought was very interesting, Bob. You assigned me, probably because you know, now I know why when you assigned rooms, you didn't have any other place to put me, to the math department. I was housed with the math department uh, over in the, um, Building 93 at Kemp Campus. Gosh, you have a good memory. And... The only person that wasn't in the math department besides me was Granville Dissing. And he was in the corner, and he was very isolated. I remember Gene Park and uh, Bowman and uh, uh, a couple other guys. I can't remember their names. I have to think on it for a while. But it was a very interesting uh, group of uh, faculty. Herman Nelson. Herman Nelson, yeah. Nelson. Oh, Herman Nelson. Remember him? Yeah, in fact, I got a good story from Herman. He's 80, 84 years old. Is he really? Yeah. Isn't that nice? And yeah. He is a little old wife. He used to bring around every now and then, you know. And, you know, these uh, old math teachers were kind of, to my way of looking at, kind of a, of a rough-speaking bunch, except for Bowman. He wasn't. But some of them, they'd speak to the students. They'd come in and they'd, they'd holler at the students. And they'd tell them to, you know, do this and do that. And I never could quite understand that, you know, uh, that's the way you ought to treat a student. But... Many of the students respected him very highly and uh, came back, and uh, I know they learned a lot of math. Um, and then, of course, the other thing that that first year, uh, you know, I taught with, uh, I taught both on Kent and I taught one course on South. 
I guess Richburg wanted me to come out and teach an introduction education course when the um, Ishprint was leaving. But uh, I rode back and forth with um, Lawton Green. And he was teaching philosophy and I was teaching, and we're both a lot alike in a lot of ways. Um, and I really, it was really a nice time. You know, you look back getting to know some folks. Was Lawton teaching out there then? He was teaching, uh, yeah, he was teaching one philosophy course and I was teaching, uh, I was teaching introduction to education. And we, we really did that for a whole year. Oh, that's right. He was teaching under uh, Roseanne. Cassiola. Yeah, I think it was Roseanne Cassiola. Yeah. That's who yeah. had, had him out there. And uh, at the conclusion of that year, Ish Brandt left the college permanently. And because Sasser came back, I didn't have a position to go to. So I, uh, I, was, I transferred to South Campus. Fortunately, Richburg uh, allowed me to come out and work out there full time. And then what I did is I traveled backwards to Kent to teach some uh, humanities and uh, maybe anthropology for you. Right. I don't know if you, were you? Yeah, I remember. You had all those things, yeah. didn't you? You had a uh, night course, I think. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I taught in that. There was a time, you'll recall, that one time, Joe Sasser and I requested from Jim Owen, Vice President Jim Owen, when I was still on South, still professor, to trade. I was going to go to Kent, and he was going to go to South, because he lived at the beach and drives all the way to Kent. Right. And I lived, I lived over by Kent and drove all the way to South. So we thought it would just be logical for us to trade. Mm -hmm. And Owen, who was the guy who couldn't make a decision, uh, had never, never decided. And so nothing ever happened. And then he left, and the and the decision just died. Because yeah. I think, if I recall correctly, you had your approval. Yeah, yeah, we you approved know. it, Sanford. Because we both taught some similar things, and you know, we uh, we approved it, and uh, let's see, Ed Napier approved it. He was provost then. Yeah. And then it just it's we like, never could get. I'm gonna have to remind Ed of that. I don't think he probably doesn't remember that. But uh, and, and if that had happened. I would predict that I never would have gotten into administration, because you know a lot of a lot of life is taking an opportunity that comes where you are. Mm -hmm. And if you move down somewhere else, you don't have that opportunity. So I uh, started out as a as a university year for action director, and that was an interesting position because it gave us in that program it was a program you remember sponsored by the same organization that sponsors Vista and the Peace Corps. Gave us an opportunity and gave me an opportunity as a relatively new person in the city. By this time, I'd been here for two and a half, three years. Your first administrative job was what? Was the director of university year for action. Oh, I didn't know. And this was a federally funded project. And I was really faculty at the same time as I was directing this program. And because of that um, opportunity, I got to know a lot of the social service agencies in the city, a lot of people that later have taken leadership positions in town and so on. Mm -hmm. And really put me in good stead for getting to know a lot of the different uh, people of the college. You know, the other thing that I did, Bob, that you might recall, is remember we had this flap over uh, instructional objectives? Oh, God. And the yeah. faculty didn't want to do them at all. And the administration, led by Dr. Weigel and Dr. Um, uh, Roland Terrell, um, they were trying to push it, push it pretty hard. And somehow we had this thing called the instructional subplan committee or something like that. Right. And I got to be the chairperson of that, which I thought was interesting because I'd only been here for a year or so, and here I was in this middle position, you know, between. But you were still faculty. Right? I was still faculty, but I was in kind of a a harmonizing position, you know, where you try to pull people together. And what we essentially did is we watered down the instructional sub plan, which was all these objectives and so on, so much that the faculty no longer felt it was an issue. And the administration, you know, I kind of just died by uh, by neglect for a while, you know. You watered down the uh, the the objectives of the subplan, right? Right, to such a degree that the faculty no longer was, you know, threatened by it or whatever. That's an important piece of... Uh... History, right? Well, you know, I, I don't know. I might have one folder of notes on that if you ever need anything. I don't even know if I kept any notes on that, Bob. But that period of time, I thought, see, when you're new in the college, you don't know what's going on. I mean, it takes you 
frankly it takes a year or two to get to know what's going on. Was that the people. first year or second year? I believe that it it was going on the first year, mm -hmm. but it was mostly just noise. I mean, as far as I was concerned. And then mm -hmm. I got involved in the Senate and a committee uh, mm -hmm. the second year. So by the second year, I was already involved. And it was in the second year when I really uh, served on that uh, in 1974, um, 75, when I served on that committee. And we really essentially put that plan to rest. And I think, I think what, what my role was, if, if anything, was to help Dr. Weigel save face and to help the faculty not have to put up with all those objectives. I mean, that was, uh, and I didn't have, I didn't have an agenda. I didn't have a plan. I just led the consensus that emerged from whatever group of people we had, you know, who am I? Who am I? Um, but I think those kinds of roles, Bob, kind of got me pushed along, you know. And then I got this University Year for Action job after that. Uh, and I was in that for about two and a half years. And I was a tenured faculty member by then. And um, I directed this University Year for Action program. And then I applied for, first administrative position I applied for was the uh, was the division chair of social sciences on the South Campus. When Richburg left, I applied for his position. And I can remember that so well. I didn't get the position, but Billy Weaver did. I don't oh, yeah. remember Billy. Oh, yeah. Laughing Billy. Right. Had this, this great laugh. I mean, yeah. if anybody ever had a great laugh, it was Billy Weaver. You hear him laughing six miles away. I know what I remember. Um, but anyway, Billy got the position, and I remember thinking at the time, you know, I'm more qualified than Billy. I wonder why I didn't get it. Mm -hmm. But I realize now that I wasn't seasoned politically enough. I mean, if you know what I mean by that, you've got, and it isn't political. It's there's a certain degree of understanding the faculty and the administration. But I was so green, I was so new, that I didn't get the position. So um, I, I did the University Year for Action program, and eventually. When who was Roseanne Cassiola's replacement? The guy that went, went to Waycross. Uh, you know who I'm talking Cassiola. about. Oh, yeah. Uh, the guy. Shoop? Shoop. Yeah. Jim Shoop. Jim Shoop. When Jim Shoop left, I, uh, I applied for the position and got the position. Um, but the interesting thing about that, you'll remember, is, is that Marion Brown challenged my appointment. Uh, you'll remember that. I remember uh, all that. Yeah. Remember that uh, difficulty that we had, and so I actually had to wait about five months while the board of trustees appointed a, um, you know, they appointed a, a committee. You know, the interesting thing was is that uh, Marion and I were really friends, and I, you know, we liked each other and so on, and I think she had, from her point of view, a legitimate complaint. Here's Dumbleton coming from social science area, coming from the University Year for Action area, who had already shown that he could do some administrative stuff. And then here's Dr. Brown, who's an outstanding expert in the humanities music field, mm -hmm. um, believing that she ought to get the position. And, uh, but it turned out that the Board of Trustees uh, hearing accepted uh, Dean Cosby's recommendation and I was hired and, you know, fate put me on the administrative. That's when I really... But she claimed she had more administrative experience? No, no. She claimed that, that she had more, she more fitted the position because of the humanities experience. Oh, okay. Right. You know, she, she had the doctorate in, um, in music from Indiana University, Indiana State, I believe. One or the other. You could check that out. Yeah, probably Indiana State. Which was an excellent, excellent music school. I mean, it's one of the best. And uh, music history and those kinds of things. And Marion is a good, top notch teacher. Um, but I know that that was a blow to her hopes of ever getting into administration, just simply because it, it made her angry at the system for a while. And, you know, I can understand why she hasn't uh, really applied since to get into administration. Mm -hmm. But uh, but then I was in that position for five years, four and a half years. 
Um, and you know, one of the things that I tell some of the younger people that want to get into administration or just advancing their job, I tell them to think about the job you want next and concentrate on preparing yourself to take that job when it comes open. And you've at least got a chance then. If you're not prepared, you're not been thinking about it and so on, you may or may not get the job. But uh, um, I set my sight, even as soon as I became, uh, and maybe even before, I was, uh, I was uh, division chair. I, I set my sights on becoming director of staff and program development. Because it just seemed to me that that was the job that best fitted my skills at least at the time, and my interest in the institution. I mean, it had a lot of variety in the job. You know, the nice thing about it, it had a lot of discretionary money. Um, it was entrepreneurial and all the kinds of things that, uh, you know, that I, you know, think I have some strength in those areas. Um, and so, lo and behold, when Dr. Terrell left to become a vice president, uh, something I can't remember what he was vice president of. Um, have you interviewed him yet? No. Roland no. Terrell? You really got to. He's okay. one of the key figures in this uh, place. Okay. Um, and he's around, I understand. His wife, you can get him out to his wife, uh, who works at UNF. But in any case, um, um, I, I, then I, I got that position as the staff and program development person. You know, one of the things that I developed Bob is as the division chair of fine arts and humanities is a reputation of taking a department that had been very, I don't know, I guess they were they were artists and they were musicians and they were humanities professors and so on, and they had been very independent. I don't want to use any negative words, but they were Good. they were a strong bunch of folks. Strong-minded, independent, strong-willed, <laughs> and you know what kind of folks I'm talking about. <laughs> and uh, but you know, even more. <laughs> but and you know, it's interesting, Bob. From the from the beginning, I I never had a problem with a single person there, not a single one. It was wonderful. Yeah, yeah. And it's just my harmonizing style. I, I don't guess. know of anybody that could have handled that. I just my harmonizing style, and I somehow or other sweetened those folks up, and uh, we had a wonderful time. And those, in my memory, in my life's memory, those were among the best years of my life in terms of a job. I mean, I, I loved that job. I loved those folks. I, I learned so much about so many things that were only on the edge of my knowledge before. And that was just, that was an outstanding, that was an outstanding time. Um, but, you know, after you've done the budget 400 times and you've planned the class schedules 400 times and you've listened to the complaints of the students about the professor 9,000 times, it's time to move on. And so I applied for the position of SPD director. And Jeff Oliver will tell you, I had a near perfect interview. You know, every now and then you just are on. It just, everything falls right. Every question they ask is the right question. And you are as articulate as you're capable of being in that interview. If I had to remember, for me, that interview as SPD director, I literally blew the socks off of the guy. Um, I know I was on the committee. Were you? Don't you remember? I, no, I don't remember even who was on it. I mean, yeah. I can't Jeff remember. Jeff Oliver's on it, too. Yeah. Jeff and you and somebody else yeah. on it. But anyway, I felt good about that interview. And uh, I felt that if I wasn't chosen as SPD director after that interview, it didn't matter because I understood why you have to pick who you have to pick, you know, to make balance and do all those kinds of things. But I knew that I was as good as any candidate that interviewed for that position. And, but I got the job. So, um, and then I must say that I love being SPD director. Um, I can't remember a lot of things we did new. I'm sure we did some. I'd have to go back and look at the record. But I do know that the I do know. I'm waiting for. Uh, let me just interrupt here sure. just a minute because SBD is so important in the growth of the college. Could we're we're trying to write this thing for maybe two readers, people okay. that are inside that know what SBD is, and maybe uh, we hope for an increasing number of people outside that 
But could you kind of give a good two sentence definition of SPD, what, uh, what it is, and then well, what are its aims, objectives, right. and so forth? Staff and program development is the is the funding in the college based upon 2% of the college's program fund put in by Rottenberger and Henderson back several years ago to assist the community colleges in the state to bring forward into a higher level of functioning efficiency the new faculty and staff that were flooding the uh, community colleges across the state. You'll recall that it was only in the 60s and 70s when most of the community colleges got started. Right. And staff and program development was that agency within those institutions which did professional development for all, all staff and faculty and turned out to be a, a very beneficial organization in that regard. The but other thing, 2% of the college's program fund. Uh, for example, oh, the, you know, the state allocates let's say $20 million per program fund, which includes salaries and- Each you know, college would have 2% of each their- Each college would have 2% of their wow. their allocated program fund, which in our case, when I was SPD director, amounted to, uh, well, I think the first year was 500 and some thousand dollars. And by the time I left, because the budget had gone up, was up to, um, oh, over, well over $600,000. You see, we could use that then for for professional development of faculty. And the other thing, though, know, Bob, is, you know, when a college is new, there are a lot of new programs coming along or ought to come along. Mm -hmm. And and SPD was that agency which helped fund those new uh, programs. Um, just as an example, if we wanted to do some new medical program to fit in with our medical program, uh, then we could use the funds of that to assist in the development of that program. Well, Several of the vocational programs came out of that SPD funding. Um, which ones? Automotive, for example. And I remember they did some uh, some uh, good work in the automotive area and writing manuals and things like that. Paul Prochet did some of that. Paul Prochet was uh, one of the key people in the, in doing that. Paul worked for that for a long time. Did he he write he wrote the manuals for the automotive area? He you? worked with the faculty who wrote the manual. He actually was kind of the, the he was the program development manager of SPD for a I long spell time. P-R-E-S-H-A, for -E Shay. What did he do again? He, he was the program uh, coordinator for staff and program development. He coordinated the program side, and others uh, coordinated the uh, staff development side. Mm -hmm. Um, there have been there were a lot of people. Dr. Terrell and Dr. Wise are the two that really got SPD started. And uh, you know, there's some Barbara Lemke used to work there. Uh, uh, SPD gave rise to international education, I and mean, it was within SPD the funds from staff and program development that started international education at SPCJ. And that again was Roland Terrell, Steve Wise, uh, Jeff Stuckman, um, and of course Connie Hoffman. Uh, who was kind of the person they hired to help do the, the daily work of it. Um, but all of that was really history by the time I became SPD director. There's a rule in SPD, as you know, Bob, that no program can be managed with SPD funds more than three years. And uh, international education was in its fourth year when I took over. So we split it off and made it an independent agency of the college, and then the college picked up the funding for that. Um, and that happened to a number of other programs and staff. One of the tasks we did is to get ourselves in complete compliance with the, the, the SBE rule. We, uh, we put those uh, folks in their, own, uh, um, in their own independent department in the college. Um, one of the things that had to happen Unfortunately, when I became director, Bob, is that it was about the time that the college got some really bad audits. I don't know if you remember that or not. Oh, yeah. Um, and uh, at the center of those bad audits was Roland Terrell and some of the practices that he had uh, carried out um, in SPD and in professional development travel and so on. And, you know, in my judgment, in, in some way or other, was the... Uh, 
was the, the beginning of the avalanche uh, that ultimately uh, caused Dr. Weigel and Dr. Ferguson and others to, and Dr. Terrell to leave the institution. Mm -hmm. um, and that's an unfortunate uh, period in our history. But so one of my tasks as FTD director was to clean house, so to speak, and to get all of the accounting correct, get all the procedures correct, get all, you know, get in complete compliance with anything that hadn't been followed in practice. And there wasn't anything bad. I think the, everybody needs to know that there wasn't anything really bad. But auditors um, invariably turn over a stone and find a, a worm or two underneath the stone, you know. So they found a couple of those, and we got those straightened out. And uh, Could you be specific on that? What exactly? Oh, well, uh, well, they might have purchased some items that uh, were put in the wrong accounts, for example, or didn't have an account trail where they were once we got them. There was some film equipment and some um, of that kind of uh, thing. What happened to the pictures that were taken? Um, what had happened to some of the accounts that the project had started, but it was never closed out, and there was no record of what really happened when it ended. Um, I'd really have to review my notes. Uh, have to find some old things to look at to even tell you exactly what to do. Uh, well, I think about. generally that. Yeah. Not an account trail and a project started and not closed out. Right, those kind of things. Those yeah. kind of things. And uh, well, we got all that straight and it got behind us quickly. I mean, one of the things I do if I have something unpleasant to do, I do it and get on with it. You know, I don't, uh, you know, I don't labor it and I don't sit and worry that we did or didn't do the right or wrong thing, you know. So. Right. Um, that was good. That part went by. Mm -hmm. um, I was SPD director for about, it was a, actually, Bob, it was an interesting time for the college because while I was SPD director, first, you know, almost as soon as I got there, we, we had the audit problems. And Dr. Ferguson and Dr. Weigel began to be questioned about other things in the institution as well. And, you know, there's always been the question. Was there an inside leak? Was there a was there a deep throat that was feeding the press? And you know, it's in all honesty, to my knowledge, to this day, nobody knows who it was. What do you think there was? I don't. I don't have any idea. I don't have a remote idea if there was somebody or not. Although I know they knew some specific details that they probably couldn't have gotten from any other. But then somebody must have told them. They had to get on the trail. You know, to know that that was the place you ought to look. Some of the travel things that they looked at, somebody must have been unhappy about what was going on and called uh, called it the attention of the press. But I don't know if that's true or not. I simply don't know. Um, I don't know of any SPD employees that were doing that, although yeah, I, there would be no way to know. You know, you'd never know because um, they wouldn't tell you if they did. Um, Dr. Terrell's management style was um, didn't please everybody. You know, I mean, sometimes you can, you know, you as an old administrator, like me as an administrator, know that you make a personnel decision sometimes, and you know, the person can be mad at you for years, and you either don't know it or don't know it. you don't even know. You just you know, hold awesome. grudges. They throw that kind of personality. They can hold grudges for something that you said no to. And uh, it's just unfortunate that that kind of thing could happen. But, uh, but in any case, while I was SPD director, very shortly after it got, uh, I, I got there, the press started making a noise about Dr. Weigel. And, uh, you know, having talked to Dr. Weigel so much over the years, I like the man enormously. Um, and I remember talking to him just before, just after I became SPD director. And he said, you know, I don't know what, he says, I've been president a long time. This is before any trouble started. He said, I've been president a long time. I wouldn't mind leaving, but I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do. He says, when you get to this level of presidency, I mean, it was a big presidency in the country. He was getting, earning a lot of money. We're a big college. He says, I don't know where to go. And so when the troubles came, I think he imagined that he could, he could survive them. I think he imagined that he could control somehow or other the outcome. 
And one of the tragedies for me personally in Ben Weigel's case was is that he didn't see the handwriting on the wall soon enough, or if he did see it, he didn't act on it soon enough, because I hated to see the man go out of his grace. Although, I mean, you know, every institution does face-saving things for its president or for its leaders. Um, nevertheless, it wasn't a good time for the college. And to see also the, the kinds of things that caused Dr. Terrell and Dr. Ferguson to have to leave under less than favorable circumstances wasn't great either. I was. But Dr. Henderson proved to be a very capable replacement for, uh, for Dr. Weigel. And because of his experience in the community college system, knew a lot of the people in the college and knew a lot about colleges, even though he hadn't personally been a president. Uh, he was good for the college. And he was, he had the right balance between, excuse me, between moving forward and holding the line for the new president to make major decisions. He had been director of community colleges. Right, for the state for yeah. maybe uh, 10, 15 years, um, for a long time. Uh, and I remember the day when, uh, you know, they were talking about once Dr. Weigel announced his resignation, almost immediately after Bob, uh, before uh, Dr. Henderson came, almost immediately after he came, they appointed this committee to, to and I remember the day he came to me and said, would I be willing to chair the search for the new president? Mm -hmm. um, and he said that, you know, my role as SPD director had been a very visible one in the college, and I was generally fairly well liked by the people, and uh, that perhaps I had the right kind of skills to. Uh, and I consider this, you know, again, the. There's, there's Dwayne down with it. I mean, Dwayne. Jack, sorry. Oh, he can come in. He probably wants to leave the paper. That's uh, all right. He went off. That's all right. Um, but but anyway, I was asked to chair the search committee, and I consider it as, as an important contribution to the college for my part. Um, and, and I must say, Bob, that the search went forth with the press right with it, and I kept them fully informed. I mean, I held hands with, uh, with Nancy Price right straight through that search process. I didn't, we didn't do anything. The committee didn't do anything. I didn't do anything. I'd let her know. I was so open that she got to the point where she didn't even come around all the time, you know. But there wasn't a hitch. There were no, everybody on the committee was harmonious. Uh, the, the outside, the consultants from ACCT that we hired, um, Bob Berenger and Jim Tatum, were most gracious and helpful to the college. Um, what were their names again? Bob Berenger. He was the president of a community college from New Jersey. B-E-R-E-N-B-A-R-R-I-N-G-E-R, -E -E -R, I think, Behringer. And who's Jim that? Tatum, P-A-T-U-M, I guess. U-M. Tatum. And Jim was the... What was were they, a, the consultants? They were these outside consultants from ACCT, the Association of Community College Trustees. Um, and they were the ones that the college hired to assist in, the, in getting the... Uh, in getting the uh, search process together and, you know, screening, help screening the applicants and so on. We had 144 applicants, 140 applicants, 140 applicants. And Behringer and Tatum helped us reduce that number to, to 16. Um, and I remember that I had, of course, read every application. I showed them to Nancy Price. Uh, we had a couple of really wild ones. We had one guy from a mental institution in California that applied, and we had another guy that claimed that he was a descendant of King uh, King Carlos of Spain, and he wanted to us uh, to address him as sir. Uh, but those were just a couple of the odd ones, and she picked up on a couple others. I think it was probably one Buddhist monk in the in the group, and something like that. And you know, those were an African that was who a descendant of uh... of King Carlos of Spain. He claimed he was, um, and wanted to be called, you know, dressed as royal sir or something like that. But in any case, those are just people. I mean, you know, people that everybody sends in their application. I'm sure. You showed all the applications. I showed all of them to Nancy, every single one. She sat there, and I even opened them in her presence if she wanted me to, just to let her know. We were very open about that, Bob. We 
I knew that if you're going to, the way to deal with the press is to be utterly open. You know, if they, and, you know as long as it's in the sunshine, we told the candidates this was a sunshine process. And so we were just as sunny as possible. All the interviews that we, so we screened that 16 down to six and decided to, um, and we decided to interview just six out of the 16. Now, we, when we had the voting process, so I recall there was one, six, one or two significant things. There was one internal candidate, Tim Whitefield, and there was one candidate from the city, the, the person that had been acting president of UNF, mm -hmm. Andy Robinson. And one of, the, one of the regrets that I had as chair is that Andy Robinson got no vote from that committee. Because, I mean, he- Was he one of the six? You know, he was one of the 16, you know, but see, the committee voted to which six they wanted to interview, who they wanted to interview. And we didn't set a number. We just said, you know, look, look where the natural break point is. But I remember Andy Robinson didn't get a single vote. And that bothered me. Just, and I wished I had voted for him, just simply because um, he was a good person. Um, but the paper picked up that he got no votes or something like that. And that was a little bit embarrassing for him probably to have applied and put his name in contention and not getting it. And it's interesting also that the president of Edward Waters College, um, Mr. Dr. Mitchell, Reverend Mitchell, was also one of the candidates, but he was screened out by the, uh, at a lower level position at the time at UNF. And he was screened out by uh, the consultants before we even got the name. Um, what were the criteria, Dwayne, for, uh, could, could you boil those down to maybe well, um, we had, a, of course, we had a long list of criteria for what we wanted the president to do. And we always joked around that we wanted him to walk on water. Um, but uh, among those things is we wanted somebody that had a vision of the future that could take the college from the, you know, colleges grow to a certain point and then they kind of coast for a while. And you will recall that our enrollment was in a serious decline from about 82 until, uh, until Dr. Spence got here in 85. And so one of the things we want to do is have a vision to take us back up <clears throat> up the hill instead of down the hill. Because at the point, at that point, when we were losing money, we were losing staff. I mean, it was it was a serious situation for the college. And so one of the things they had to have vision. We wanted somebody that had experience, ideally had experience as a president. Um, another criteria, which interestingly we didn't uh, we didn't uh, follow through on, was is that the person ideally would have been a teacher, a professor. Dr. Spence's background was as a counselor and um, and had done minimal teaching compared. We said we wanted somebody that had taught two years. But it didn't matter. I mean, counseling was a perfectly good uh, background for him. And uh, we also wanted to have, in our group, we wanted to have some balance in terms of, you know, racial and um, ethnic uh, background in the pool so that we could make sure difficult part was is that there were no strong women who even applied for the position. Um, say nothing about, you know, got into the, I think there were two in the final group, but then final 16, but they weren't strong candidates from the beginning. Um, you don't have women now? Mm -hmm, women. And there was, uh, I'm trying to remember if there was one or two, there was only one minority person, I believe, Ralph Cortada. And he got into that. He was one of the interview because he had a, he was a very good uh, candidate. In fact, he was in the final three. Yeah. You know, he was a, a really tough candidate. And he, I understand now, he's the president. He was the president of California. Wanted to come back east, and he's the president in either Washington D.C. or his credentials really impressive. Really, they really were. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. um, he might have been too liberal artsy for this part. I'm sure he was. I'm sure he was. He didn't have a background in terms of our kind of vocational kind of stuff. Now, I think out of all the candidates that we got the perfect choice. I don't think there's any question in my mind or almost anybody else that served on that uh, search committee that Dr. Spence best combined the things we need. And what I remember Bob most wanting, somebody that could come in and continue to bring harmony that Dr. Henderson had started. And um, it was... It was uh, was really wonderful that Dr. Spence came in and was able to continue that. And also had that vision. I mean, he had that vision and he still got that vision that this college can become a lot greater than it is. Um, 
no matter how good it is, you can always be better. And that's Dr. Spencer. He's always three steps ahead, um, keeping the keeping the college uh, moving in the direction it needs to go. Um, what about these? Uh, well, go ahead. If you anything else, that's that's really good news there on that. Um, well, then after Dr. Spence came as president, um, it was a short period of time after that he asked me to be his executive assistant. I think within, I served along with Dr. Joan Hill as, as kind of like assistant to the president. I think the FDD director and uh, Joan was in the role of assistant to Dr. Henderson. I think the two of us spent a lot of time consulting with him in terms of a number of things in the institution because, and there were some other vice presidents that did too, but they were more functional. We were more general. We didn't have a specific thing to do that uh, was, we didn't have a functional responsibility. Um, and so we had a lot of input at that early time. And then when Dr. Spence came replacing Dr. Henderson, I think it continued right along. Um, and Dr. Hill, of course, became the provost of South Campus when uh, um, Oliver uh, decided to step down, or the president decided to have him step down as provost. And uh, um, and then I became executive assistant to the president. And that was by early fall. And he only came in June. So I mean, within within three four months after he was here, he had made those two personnel decisions. Um, and then I served Dr. Spence as his executive assistant for two and a half years. I think it was two and a half years before I was appointed as provost here. That job was a nice job because it gave me, it kind of rounded out. One of the things you get, Bob, when you're the SPD director is the big picture. You know, I sat in on the council. I, I met with the president and the executive vice president a lot. And you get a, the big picture of the college quickly. And you, you learn not to argue for parochial interests. Even if parochial interests are correct, you learn to be able to look beyond that to see all the things that have to be considered. And I know a lot of times that individual administrative staff and myself included in previous positions don't understand why they don't do it this way or they don't do it that way. And frequently it's because you got to think of seven things instead of two things. And that's the job. And and, and fortunately, as SBD director, I, I began to get that perspective. And as executive assistant to the president, I clearly got it. Um, that was a good position. And I'm sure that I, you know, made some help to Dr. Spence. It did, you know, was helpful to Dr. Spence in that, uh, in the beginning years of his presidency. But for me personally, it wasn't most rewarding because in that sense, I, some of my own skills were more subordinated, and you do what the president wants you to do. I mean, you can imagine if you become somebody's executive assistant, you aren't really independently thinking anymore. Um, and I feel I have more opportunity to do that as provost. Um, in the history of a long lifetime of work, the executive assistant to the president position, I think, for me personally, will be less important than some of the other positions mm -hmm. I've held in terms of my own growth. Although I must say that I got to know the board well, worked with the board well. I got to know state agencies and state board of community colleges and those kinds of things much better than I had before mm -hmm. and so on as executive assistant to the president. Mm -hmm. But uh, what what is the chain of command now? Starting with Spence. Who Spence is and Dr. Napier who was the executive vice president of, of um, operations, I guess maybe, I don't know if it's called campus operations or what it is. But anyway, he acts in the role almost, he's almost like an executive vice president with the strong component of the financial side under Jack Spears, the vice president for business. Um, well, what is Ed's title? VP for? I think he's the vice president for campus operations, I believe it. The college or campus? Maybe it's it must be college. Probably college. it was campus. I think he changed it to college operations. That's probably right. Then who reports to him? All of the deans report to uh, um, the deans. Dr. Gallon and Dr. Cosby report to him. Carol Miner did until she became the provost. All of the deans report to Napier. Mm -hmm. 
and the provost report to him for functional aspects. And they report to the president for most of the other kinds of things, although that's technical. Um, in actual fact, we work most directly with Dr. Napier in running the campus. And we, we spend more time with probably with Dr. Spence meeting the outside world. You know, provosts have the dual role now of being both the, the operational person for the campus and the link with the community from the campus. This is an example I serve on. I serve on somewhere between 12 and 15 boards and organizations. Now, since I've been provost, you know, getting involved with those kinds of things. Um, so and beyond that, Dr. Napier for campus functions and to Dr. Spence for outside community. Really for everything, yeah, for everything else. For, for everything else. But but at the provost level, Bob, reporting relationship isn't that important. I mean, we we need to act independently. We we hopefully don't need much supervision anymore, and. We and so what we do is we consult with problems with the person that can most help us. If it's a financial problem, we talk to the, uh, Mr. Spears. If it's almost any other kind of problem, we talk to Dr. Napier, um, or maybe one of the other vice presidents. Um, you know, because each of them have some functional responsibility. We talk to Lynn Parker quite a bit about uh, human resource issues and planning issues. But and again, in her case, that's more recent. You know, she's. Uh, but see, so you think about it now, I've only been problem not even a year and a half yet. So I'm still the new kid on the block in terms of problem. Dwayne, this has been really great. Good. We've got your whole career.